Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours with Professor Ludmir. Very excited to have you here today. Thanks so much for joining us. And I thought we would start with just getting to know you a little bit better. I know you're, you've been practicing as an entertainment lawyer for many years, but what initially interested you in entertainment law? And share a little bit more about your journey into this space. Sure. Um, well, thanks, Anitha, for uh, giving me the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you. I guess my entertainment law journey or interest in it, uh, you know, began at a similar, I'd say, state of, of economic uncertainty writ large. It was, um, you know, the, uh, the, the recession of 08, um, where it was just carnage in the, in, in the legal field and specifically in the one that I was practicing in. So I originally got my start working in an entirely different industry uh, from entertainment and that is renewable energy and infrastructure. And so when the bottom fell out of the economy in, in 08 and the you know, production incentives dried up for purposes of you know, building the, the utility scale projects that I was working on, entertainment suddenly seemed like a recession-proof industry that I might look into for, for purposes of my own job security, but also because I always had uh, an interest in media. Um, and in my case, specifically Spanish language media, um, you know, like I, I, I had a dream um, of working with or for Univision, the, uh, uh -huh. the Spanish language network. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, that, that dream got sidetracked a little bit while I pursued wind turbines and solar panels. Um, <laughs> but it always remained something that I was interested in, just the reach of the medium um, and the interesting personalities that are involved. The the fact that it's, uh, you know, people think of it as this monolithic area, but it's not entertainment law can mean many things. Uh, it means, at least in my case, the intersection of tech and media. It can mean, you know, if you're if you have a talent practice representing talent, but that's not always relegated just to uh, industry specific issues or topics. It could be anything and everything, um, but that has a tie to the entertainment industry and that makes it um, for some people, more interesting. For others, um, you know, those of us that are you know, a little bit jaded, having practiced in the industry for a long time, somewhat <laughs> burdensome. Um, but in any event, uh, I found myself uh, sort of thrust into entertainment law due to um, you know sort of the the uh, you know the the world being shocked by the the recession of '08. And uh, originally, I. I I was living in an apartment building in Koreatown in LA at the time. And my neighbors would see me coming home from the printer. If you can believe that even back then, I know you're a, a recovering m and attorney, um, <laughs> you know, actually going to a, a physical printer to, uh, to conclude a transaction and literally printing out, uh, you know, version after version of documents of the clothing documents and you know, by the way the irony was not lost on me that here i am trying to you know trying to close a, an environmentally responsible uh renewable energy project and you know like decimating the amazon rainforest uh with each deal that we closed and so my neighbors in in the apartment building would see me coming back with you know uh boxes and boxes of files and uh many of them because this is la were like you know fill in the blank aspiring director, writer, in my case, for whatever reason, my building had a lot of musicians. Uh, and so, you know, my musician neighbors would see me coming back and they're like, oh, you know, you look like a fairly responsible person. Would you mind looking at this contract? And this is an era when, um, you know, The Voice and America's Got Talent, American Idol uh, were starting to become uh, very popular. And so, uh, you know, they, they were vehicles that allowed people uh, who were artists to get their shot at potential record deal, stardom, what have you. And so, so my first, my first shot in entertainment law was, uh, you know, doing something that I probably shouldn't have. I was not qualified to do uh, <laughs> at the time uh, as a renewable energy attorney, but, you know, these, these contracts that my neighbors were, uh, were being handed were so, um, you know, sort of like, uneven and draconian that I'm like, you might as well have somebody that is, that is practicing with solar panels and, and uh, wind turbines taking a look at this for you because you have no, you have no leverage whatsoever. But uh, long story short, that's, 
sort of my official foray into uh, entertainment in in a uh, you know in the capacity of a legal representative. I think it's great that you work in entertainment because you're a great storyteller, and I feel like a little bit of magic happened in your own life. But you touched on this already, but I'll ask the question anyway. You know, how did you go from renewable energy to entertainment? And I I understand that obviously legal skills are transferable, but how did you kind of combine your passion, your interest, and then just jump into this new field that um, you had, like you said, no exposure to, but a lot of passion for? Uh, so yeah, what it, what I mentioned was um, educating myself for what I anticipate, what I anticipated client questions might be of me, and familiarizing myself with uh, the industry led me to to seek education. Um, and uh, I went specifically to this nonprofit in LA called California Lawyers for the Arts that had seminars that were open to the public. And I tried to prioritize um, educational settings or seminars uh, that the, the lawyer to non-lawyer ratio was in favor of the non-lawyers because I wanted to get insights uh, as though I were a client or you know, have the perspective and understand what the questions might be uh, from that point of view. And so those turned out to be very useful uh, for me for two reasons. One is, you know, to understand the, the legal issues and uh, how they, they come into play in, in actual practice. But um, more than that, it was to get to know some people that, that were actually working in the space. So it was, it was part educational, part networking. And I think the combination of those two um, allowed me uh, to feel confident enough to make that transition. Because yeah, from an objective point of view, what does one industry have, have to do with the other? But, you know, and this is the case that I made when I finally decided to, um, you know, take the, the cottage industry that, uh, of, of representation that I'd created for myself around, you know, people that were trying out for The Voice and all these song competition shows and actually try and join a firm uh, with an entertainment department was, uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with transactions uh, and they all are about, you know, competing leverage. As we know, all contracts are, uh, you know, offer an acceptance and consideration. And so this just happens to have, you know, overblown personalities and, um, you know, it's, it's a less capitalized industry than, than the other transactions that I'm dealing with. So um, all that is to say that, that uh, um, you know, the transition was not as, uh, as, as, as difficult as you might think. That's great. So, I mean, and great advice. Thank you for kind of sharing some of those steps that you took. So you teach a class called Digital Media Transactions, and you taught it for the first time last year. And you put a lot of work developing the class and then teaching it. So I'm curious, this is more of a, a two-part question. One is, how'd you go about picking topics uh, to teach and create an outline for the course, Digital Media Transactions? And then how much of your current practice today informs the way you teach? Great question. So um, having never done this before, uh, I, I decided to just, you know, divide the class up into two, uh, two main areas. One area of focus was I was committed to teaching the mechanics of contract review and negotiation because I felt in my own uh, you know, law school experience, as many people do, that I was not well equipped to actually, you know, I had no experience with that skill. It was something that was honed, um, you know, through trial and error and, uh, you know, in practice itself. And so that was sort of the guiding, um, I'd say the, the, the overarching objective of, you know, what I wanted people to get out of this, students to get out of this course. And so, um, First, what I did is I said, all right, the, the first half of the class, we're going to focus on the mechanics of contracts and we'll spend the first few sessions going term by term of what, you know, you'd expect to find in a typical contract in the entertainment industry. Um, and then, you know, with, with, with subsequent sessions, sort of identify specific contracts uh, that, you know, you like you'd only find in the entertainment industry and on other words, in other words, to be clear, the, the, the first session would be about identifying general uh, 
contractual provisions. And then the other ones would be about, you know, dissecting uh, an entertainment specific contract. And then the second half of the course, the way that I thought about it was just going through the areas of entertainment that I practice and that I have clients in and having those be a vertical for each week of the course. So, um, you know, music and specifically the, the take that I had is, you know, music in the digital era. Um, same with film and TV and then, uh, you know, AR, VR gaming, you know, what, what is lumped together in, in, uh, in the new media category were the remaining weeks. And so, it, you know, and, and then what else would also guide it is I wanted to have uh, a guest speaker component uh, of clients and people that I work with or across from who are, you know, deeply involved with the issues that we cover in class. And, you know, their schedules somewhat dictated how I organized the class because, you know, I, I, I identified them as a speaker that has a particular expertise in you know that week's subject matter and and i'm like well I, I would like to have this person come talk and so that became the basis for uh you know another week's topic so mm -hmm. in that way it evolved yeah no i've looked at your guest speaker interviews and i actually recognized a couple of names which was it was really nice to make that connection of maybe a podcast i listened to and then you had that podcast host as someone you interviewed and i won't I want to give away names so students take the class and actually discover who those interviewees are. But yeah, it's a really great way to tie all the materials together. I guess my last question for you is sort of a two-parter again. You know, why why should we care about digital media? And then what advice do you have to for students who are interested in digital media? Great question. Um, I mean, this sounds self-serving, but but uh, uh, you know, I wish I would have had the opportunity to take a class on uh digital media not necessarily because it was you know it would ultimately be related to what i practice and what i make a living off of but um more than just that it's so pervasive uh digital media in our daily lives you know independent of its connection to entertainment but so much of our lives uh are impacted uh and involved and you know on some form of digital media. So understanding the legal impact of it, I think is a, it's a necessary part of, of living in the modern world. Um, and I, I'd say also people, people have, we spend, it's interesting that you asked this question because we, we, we spend the very first uh, class talking about what digital media actually means. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's, you know, and, and I won't give away the entire course, but we start with a Wikipedia definition and that's by design, you know, not the most reliable source you'd think for academic subject matter, but, um, you know, in and of itself, it's reflective of what digital media means and what it can be and how mutable it is. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I'd want students to, to take this class, um, I think for, for two reasons. One, because, uh, and this is probably not the sexiest part of the class, but you know, having an, uh, an understanding of the fundamentals of a contract will serve students well, irrespective of whether or not they decide to practice law, whether they decide to work in the entertainment industry. I think that, that being able to know your way around a contract is, you know, is, it, is an essential life skill at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's number one. And number two, for those who are interested in pursuing a, a career or, or at least learning more about the entertainment industry, um, seeing it through the legal lens is, uh, is important because, uh, you know, I, I think that, that it'll, it, it gives you an edge over others that may not have the tools to, you know, assess aspects of the industry or trends or business transactions, um, and, you know, for that reason, again, like to make this as practical as possible, uh, you know, for, for folks to take away what they learn in this class and, you know, be able to apply it immediately, that aspect I think is, is critical. Um, and that would be my commitment to students that they have uh, a practical skill set that they can take away from this class and apply it immediately in their, in their careers, in their daily lives. Fantastic. Well, we really appreciate your time and all your insights, Professor Ludmer. Thank you so much. And I hope uh, students watching this will take advantage and enroll in your class.